It's the ladies first. It's the ladies. It's the ladies first. Okay, everybody, what's going on? Hi, everyone. It's the Old Ladies First panel for a special interview episode. Okay, this is going to be airing before this week's episode of the Old Ladies First panel with all of the ladies. Okay, so how are you guys doing before we pop our special guest in? Mighty right. fine. Great. I was on mute. I know. Girl, listen, I'm glad. As always. You, I like that we everybody got their uh, glasses on. Um, okay. Jackie is giving um, uh, Jackie Jordan a cursy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's giving I run track in the early 90s, late 80s. And I it's love it. Period. Run it, run it. Period. <laughs> at, first, at first, it was giving mama with the coat in, in the front seat in the station wagon. That's what it was giving at first. Boy, don't ask me to go to, to K&B. But... Literally. <laughs> <laughs> but now it's giving okay i am about to race you hoes and my nails are long um so yes you guys we all saw um this episode of eight at the table and i just felt like this they had a guest miss michelle hope on there she's a sexologist and i just felt like they did not do her justice like there was a lack of um, maturity involved in the interview. And I thought it would be really lovely to have her come over here on the Ooh Ladies First panel so we can have a better conversation about such things. And we have questions from everybody, okay? So mm -hmm. we're gonna go ahead um, and introduce Miss Michelle, but first I wanna do this. <laughs> Listen, all of the body rolling that's going on in this. <laughs> Hi, Michelle. How hey, are hey. you? Hey. My, I'm my, good. My titties wanted to come and make an appearance too, apparently. Nice. <laughs> they Sometimes look that happens. It I, does. I, I feel pleased about it. Um, so we are excited to have you with us. Um, I want to just go ahead and thank you, first of all, for um, coming on and being so, so gracious. She really, you know, hit me up quickly about it. People be acting funny when it comes to these interviews. So I really love when people make it easy. So thank you mm -hmm. so much, Michelle, for just the overall experience. OK, um, so we're going to delve right into these questions. Okay, you know, first of all, put her in the middle, yes. put her in the hot seat in the middle. Listen, ma'am, I was there with you. We were here. Um, it was where I was like, let me move her, okay? And <laughs> Jelly's like, hey, move her. Um, but let's go ahead and get into the first question for Michelle, okay? okay? Um, so what is a sexologist? Oh, well, I'm really glad you asked. So a sexologist can be a lot of things, but the primary uh, foundation of the work is that you study human sexual relationships. So it's a person who studies sexual relationships okay um and, and what type of uh schooling is involved so i i don't know what everybody else does because a lot of people do a lot of things honey some of them you know go to the hard knock the school of hard knocks which is fine that is where i went before i went to college you know i have never been ashamed to talk about my past or how my journey has led me to this work or some of the things I did prior to getting an academic foundation in the work. Um, but I personally studied in undergrad black history um, and human development. And then in grad school, um, I studied for the first part of grad school, I studied marriage family therapy with an emphasis in AFAM family studies, and then realized like, oh, black people are not going to therapy. But this was quite some time ago because I'm grown grown. And I shifted to human development with an emphasis on adult learning theory, because through the work that I had done in marriage family therapy school, I had realized that sex, love, relationships, all of that is a learned behavior. So if I studied human development with an emphasis on learning theory, I could understand how people had learned about sex and sexuality and love and relationships and help them kind of unlearn the unhealthy things and then really help them reestablish a foundation in what was healthy relationships. Mm. Okay. Interesting. 
I don't know if that's huh. nerdy or not as cool as what people <laughs> wanted, but I did go to the school Ooh. of hard knocks. Like, see, okay, that's that's what happened. So we want to know how was your experience shooting the eight at the table? <laughs> your face. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's um, it was interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Listen, I think a lot of people, when they see the clips that I've done and they look at my bio or they see the work that I've done or they see how I speak, um, they assume that I am some sort of, you know, Kai Sadiddy. I've actually been called Whitley quite a few times from mm. like, it's a different world. Mm. Um, and I... I think that's a backhanded compliment. Like, mm -hmm. I'm down. Me. Like a snooty know-it-all. Right. And I'm right. not that, like, if you got to know me and you could kick it with me and you could be with me on a regular basis, you'd be like, that is really not her personality at all. Um, but, you know, hypopigmentation is a real thing. Hypodescendency is a real thing in our community. I have been called a passable black woman. I have been called a transracial woman. And I would really like to set the record straight. I'm a black woman, period, point blank. Um, I recognize the importance of creating an opportunity to take high level theory and academic theory and translating it to communities, my community that really need it, which requires me to code shift or code switch, mm -hmm. um, and I and I vacillate back and forth. But you know, give me a few Hennessies and a lot of words I wouldn't <laughs> regularly use, but I assimilate with, uh, would come out of my mouth. Um, so I felt really bad about that. But I will say that out of all the interviews I've ever done, that was the first interview that I realized I can no longer go somewhere by myself mm -hmm. because there was a lot of. Uh, information that I was given ahead of time that was not followed up on um, in an authentic manner. And it put me in a position where I felt on the defensive. So if I came off a bit more aggressive, it was about drawing boundaries and trying yeah. to protect myself to the best of my ability. Because I was put in a situation, when you are somebody who has studied this for 15 years and you're put on a couch with five other people, um, and not told that the interview is going to be live when you show up and you had oh, made it oh. and you had made it very clear what you talk about. Cause like I am a sexologist. I study human sexual, human sexuality in context of how it shows up in people's lives. But I really look at how sexuality impacts social justice, how race, class, education, and sexuality, um, continue to create opportunities where our community, communities of, of color are oppressed. And that was not what they wanted to talk about. Now I can tell you how to suck a mean dick, right? I can do all that. I can tell you how to pop that pussy, but that was not what I was told we would be talking about. So okay. My best. Bait and switch, bait and switch. You know, I, I I agree and I can see where you're coming from because whenever we saw the interview, I felt like you came off as a Whitley for lack of better term, because you were trying to educate. And it was in that moment that it didn't seem as though you could educate. So I could see that being frustrating, but this vibe that we've been getting from you from jump has just been fun. Let's talk about it. So I'm glad that you're here. So let, let me ask this question that all the people want to know. Yep. Is there a way to achieve multiple orgasms? There is. Well, are we talking about men or women? Because because we got to talk about how the body works. Okay. This is the lady. This is the old lady's first panel. So this is for us. Okay. So first of all, what's super super exciting is that women can achieve multiple orgasms during a a, a very short period. So when you look at the human sexual response cycle, right now we're talking about psychology and how the brain works. I have always tried to tell people the brain is the most important part of sex. Like, yes, our genitals are important. Yes, the touch, the feel. But if your brain is not in it, 
nothing is in it, okay? There is actually something called the pudendal nerve, right? The pudendal nerve runs from the base of the brain um, down the spine, and it communicates messages from the genitals to the brain and from the brain to the genitals, okay? Super, super important. And when we start to think about how, um, how we come to be aroused, first you have to like get mentally stimulated, okay? Then you reach this period of arousal. And then from arousal, you start to hit a plateau. And from the plateau, you hit orgasm. Now, the difference between men and women is that women can go from the plateau phase to the orgasm phase, back down to plateau phase, back up to orgasm um, phase multiple times. So it's kind of like, whereas men, they will hit the plateau phase, then the orgasm phase, and then they have to go through something called the refractor phase, okay? So that's after they ejaculate, their um, member becomes soft, okay? But um, depending on their refractor period and how long that takes, they'll become hard again, right? The older you are, oftentimes the longer the refractor period is. So, but women, yes, we can have multiple orgasms. And let's not forget, orgasms are not just clitoral. They're not just vaginal. They can be nipple stimulated. They can be in different areas. So when you say, can women experience uh, multiple orgasms? The answer is absolutely yes. But how in tune are we as women to our bodies? How in tune are we to tap in to our ability to shut out all the outside noise because men and women's brains function very differently, which can impact our ability to orgasm. That makes sense. That's that. Said, let me recharge. Right. <laughs> hey, hey, yes. Hey. Okay. So this is kind of switching gears like a, just a little bit. So when it comes to like the over sexualization of the culture, do you feel like um, artists like Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion contribute to the over sexualization of the culture? Well, here, well, well I'm not going to put it on them. I will never put it on a woman who is sexually liberated and vocally or um, expressing their wants. Okay. I'm going to look at it from the perspective of the Carl's Jr. commercial that we saw in the mid 2000s, where Paris Hilton ate a cheeseburger and some ketchup dripped on her titty and they hypersexualized that, right? That is a great example of sexualization and how um, a lot of marketing companies will use sexuality as a way to sell products, right? But if Cardi B is talking about, I want you to park that Mack truck right in this little garage, I think that is a liberated space to come um, and ask for what you want. She is clearly articulating, I want y'all big she wants. Right in my little garage. Yes, 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 yes. Bring it. Bring it's it. It's the skinny right. dick for me. It's Hello? This is what we're talking about. Consensual <laughs> talk. Okay? He said... Park the Mac truck into the garage. Okay, Cardi, we go, we gonna pull up. We gonna pull up. But what I was, I do want to just address in that interview, I was not shaming anyone's conversation in the bedroom. I was just posing the question: do we have any other language aside from beat it up? Apparently, Cardi does. She says, bring your Mac truck into this little garage. But oftentimes when we talk about sex in our community, we say things like, I'm going to beat it up, murder the club, pound the pussy. And so if a woman is saying, and I got a lot of messages and a lot of hate in comments talking about white women do it all the time. They talk about fuck my brains out. If a woman says fuck my brains out, okay, cool. But what I was really speaking to is how in our community, we have normalized this conversation to permeate our music, our television, our normal conversations, and we're not providing context for young people. And sex education in the United States is lacking to such an extent that we start to allow for young people to go to pornography sites to see and learn and educate them selves about sex. And we know oftentimes in porn, there's no conversation about consent because that's already done before anybody gets on set. 
contracts have been signed. Everybody knows what's going to happen. They've all agreed to it. But if we're out here using this language so loosely, we're really leading our young people down a path of really shitty, abusive sex. That was my point. But if you like to be choked, spanked, had your hair pulled, have your pussy beat up, cool. Welcome to the club. All I'm saying is, is that the only language that we have? Because some people don't even think about it like that. To where right. you are so young, but you don't understand that's not the only type of sex there is. So you're just walking around every day, getting your pussy blown out. And you don't really need, or you don't even know to say, I want something different. Because you're used to watching porn, which is very aggressive. You don't really have much, like, good, this is what sex is really like porn. It's like, this is, porn is for porn. Porn is to show you things that may not be typical. So that is true. But also, here's the deal. I Here's the thing people don't understand. Like, I have done this job for a very long time. And for a large portion of my career, I created sex education programming for urban communities, youth in urban communities. And do you know sometimes I would show up to class and I would tell the class, like, hey, ladies, if it don't feel good, you ain't got to do it. So stop. And it you would think all the light bulbs in the room was exploding because they were like, wait a minute, what? It's supposed to feel good. And I think that that's where we are really doing a disservice to our future generations. We're not centering female pleasure. We're not talking about the importance of communication and asking our partners, what do you like? What do you want to try? And when we, we don't teach that, we are leaving a gap in the space of consent, which is putting a lot of people at risk. And we just we just choose not to talk about it. We continue to bury our heads in the sand because we want to be like, I'm going to beat it up. I don't know. Listen, people don't... Nisi and I actually just did a whole conversation about the Bill Cosby documentary. Mm -hmm. And even in the comments, like we're basically laying out like a fact check documentary with evidence, like as much evidence as one can have of someone perpetrating assault constantly. And people are still in the comments with such a weird, like, let's not talk about it, but I'm here to listen to what you have to say type of vibe. Like, and then the arguing about what girls know, like there was one comment specifically because we were talking about how a 15 year old girl was in the Playboy Mansion. And the question then is like posed as if the 15 year old was more responsible than the adults around her. Well, what was a 15 year old doing in the Playboy Mansion? She knew what was up. What the fuck is that? Like, <laughs> I just think the whole conversation is violent, like as a whole. Violent. Mm -hmm. Well, I, but I, I, first of all, I want to be very clear that sex is not violent by nature. It doesn't have to be. And if we for provided people with proper education, then we could shift the conversation. Cause you know, I, I see in some of the con cons comments, people are talking about BDSM. All right. Mm -hmm. BDSM is a lifestyle bondage, mm -hmm. discipline, sadomasochism. All right. That is a lifestyle and actually BDSM communities have a better grasp on what consent and sexual safety is than your average, what some would consider vanilla populations. Because when you move in a BDSM community, consent is really, really important, right? So over communicating is really, really important. And it is a very normal part of the experience. Do you like you talk about what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do prior to any type of scene? You identify a safe word. And if you saw that whole eight at the table interview, I asked the crew, do you have a safe word? And they're like, that's not sexy. And it's like, listen, if you really want to get sexy and freaky dinky with it, you have to set up some parameters. Because if you really trying to go there, you're going to take yourself to some places you ain't never been before. So where is your airbag? Where's the safety? Airbag. Like, what's she going to do? Are you going to pass out for the sake of trying to be sexy? Or right. do you, you have, have 
or trusting that the person will know how when the they person's eyes Cleo. are closed they're like they're not miss cleo they cannot read minds i can't focus when i'm nothing i don't know that, what anybody and, else is doing actually i really appreciate that you just said you cannot focus when you're nutty and that is an actually a, a now let's take it back to the brain a large portion of the brain shuts down when you orgasm it's like taking a shot of heroin so you have to put in airbags because you trying to take yourself to the outer limits of consciousness through orgasm. That is how you reach the highest level of orgasm. You're not going to be able to think. So you just have to set the parameters. So when I was talking about why are you trying to beat us up? Why are you this? I really was just trying to present to the audience a question. Do you have any other language? Where have you learned this language? Not to mention, and I've said this in a lot of conversations, and I'm going to say it and people are going to be mad. I would not want to be anything other than a black woman because I think black being a black woman is the highest honor. We are the salt of the earth. But all these viral videos of it's a great day to be a black woman, use a goddamn lie. No, it is not. Society shits on us constantly. We're either not black enough, we are too black, we are not, we got to wear our hair this way or that way, or we have to show up a certain way. We always have to have an S on our chest and be a superwoman for our community. And according to the FBI in 2020, four black women or girls were murdered every single day. So somebody tell me, make it make sense. Tell me how, how, how is today a great day to be a black woman? Because quite frankly, I would never want to be anything other, but society has not created a world or a space for us that it is a great day ever. It, they it see it as period. access. They see it as the access because we now have more access without having to go through a man in their mind. That means that we're standing on greater foot. And it's like, no, 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 no. A lot of us are in the spaces that we are in because we fought hard to be in those spaces, not because anybody made it easy Too for hard. us. We have no choice. Very hard. We have, exactly. Like, what are we going to do? Who, who are we going to depend on, if not ourselves, in light, like in life? Mm, like, even when we worse. have partners, they're, you know? Child. Nothing worse than a white woman telling you you're such a strong black woman. <laughs> I've had a white woman like, tell me that before, and I was... Oh, you want to look at her and be like, and you're such a weak one. Or how exactly. do you think I, or no, how do you, oh, I understand. You don't understand. You can never tell me you understand shit that I go through. So I hate that I get and you don't get it either. Just go sit down, go sit down over there. And and, and then I I get really sad because you know, I, I actually once had um I've had black men look at me and say, You consider yourself a black woman? And that is the most offensive. I am, I am honored. Yes. Um, am I biracial? Absolutely. But first and foremost, I'm a black woman, period, point blank. Would anybody ever look at Frederick Douglass and say, well, you really consider yourself a black man? I have I said this many times. I have said this many times. <laughs> it's funny that people, because people always want to measure somebody's blackness as if skin tone is a direct, um, you know, correlation to your genetics. And it's not, it's not because there are light complected black people from Africa that have not been, um, you know, infiltrated by caucasity. Come on. With <laughs> or even worse, economic okay. status. Come on. Economic status. When they try to uh, correlate that into being black enough. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh. It, it... I'm sorry. We got on a race thing, but I see some really good questions in your comments. I've oh, got... please. So I just saw somebody ask, um, what are the consequences of sexual abuse on a woman's sex life? Child, let's just remove a gender on that one. What are the consequences of sexual abuse on a sex life? They can actually be really far um, reaching. And, and, I, and I know that this was a question that y'all wanted to ask me. I first and foremost want to let anyone know that's watching this. Um, if you have experienced sexual assault, it was not your fault. Okay. Um, 
And I am sorry that you had to experience that. I am someone who d has experienced sexual assault multiple times. I do not identify as a survivor, rather a thriver. That is what I choose to identify as. Um, I first and foremost want to encourage you to connect with a therapist. Secondarily, um, and I know this was one of your questions, and I apologize if, if y'all, if I'm getting ahead, but I saw the question pop up and I wanted to address it. Um, communication is key in sexual relationships because having some type of sexual trauma can really impede your performance and your enjoyment in the bedroom because there are moments where you might not feel safe. But the best way for you to create more safety is actually being able to be honest with your partner. Um, and prior to actually getting in the bedroom, saying something like, hey, I need to let you know I have experienced some type of sexual trauma. And that's not always physical trauma. Like, I could tell you a story about how in eighth grade, I went to like the eighth grade end of year party and we played truth or dare. And I grew up in Indiana, it's all white people. And I had to flash somebody my breasts, right? And you know, I'm a brown skinned girl. So my nipples is brown, but I was the only brown skinned girl in my class. So they were used to very pink nipples. So they called me chocolate pepperonis from eighth grade to my senior year. And someone brought it up at the senior year dinner. Um, so that was a trauma for me. So for the longest time in my 20s, um, I would not have intercourse without a bra on or covering my nipples because I was ashamed. That's not a physical trauma, but that is a trauma that happened to me. So really being able to recognize your own traumas and talk to yourself and or journal about it and or talk to a therapist is the first step. And then making sure you share that information with your sexual partner. So fast forward beyond chocolate pepperonis, still haunts me to this day. Um, I have experienced physical sexual trauma. So I try to really let my partners know, hey, I have a history of sexual trauma. Therefore, there are some things that are not going to be okay for me as they will be triggers. Um, and I really try to let people know that that's okay to tell your partner. And if your partner is not okay handling that, probably should not be someone you're having sex with. But I say all that with the caveat that in our community, we don't talk about the sexual trauma that Black men experience. It's kind of problematic. And we need to start fostering more conversations um, about sexual abuse on both sides of the gender. And when I talk about, or when I, in this moment, when I'm speaking about black men who have experienced sexual trauma, I don't want anyone to think I'm saying black men who have experienced sexual trauma from other men. Oftentimes in the experience that I have had working in this space, teaching in this space, being a advocate in this space and working with black men, a lot of the trauma I've seen has been brought about by by older women. And they've been like 12, 11, 13, and have had sexual relationships with women that are much older than them. Babysitters, aunties, friends, aunties. Um, and we don't acknowledge that. Um, and that is, that creates a lot of we have to start having these conversations. And I know I'm dumping a lot out, but I just feel like I'm in a space where I have an opportunity where people are listening. And I just want to scream from the mountaintops. We have a lot of work to do and I want to yeah. do the work and I'm here to do the work. So it's, it's funny that you say that because that is very, very true. Like when I was growing up, um, you know, as a young girl, you don't even want your boyfriend to be a virgin. Like, if you're having sex with your boyfriend at 16, you are pretty much assuming that he has sex between the ages of probably 11 and 13, maybe sometimes 14, but usually between those ages as to be prepared to have sex with you <laughs> when he gets to be 16, 17, 18. So mm -hmm. like that was not considered cool to like even have a boyfriend at my age that was my age 
that was also doing this for, for the first time with me. Like that wasn't considered to be cool because it was like, well, he's not going to know what he's doing and it's going to be my first time. I don't need to be with somebody. I don't know what they're doing. If I don't know what I'm doing. Like that's the mindset you have. But I think that's a part of the problem. That's a part of the problem. Like well, that's not okay. Because <laughs> well, a lot of those things happen with older girls, like sisters, best friends, like you were saying, aunts and all it. Like a lot of those times I've heard it was someone older. Well, I think there's like shame around. I think the reason people don't have the conversation, people sometimes like to focus on the nasty old men and not knowing it's also nasty old women. Mm -hmm. And so when it's the con the, when the conversation has to shift, like, well, you know women hurt children too, male and female, and they don't want to have that conversation either. So it's like, I, I wish, I think back in the day, you just didn't talk about it. Like it, that, that you just didn't. But I like that now there are more conversations about what really happened back in the day and what's still happening now, who you can and can't trust and, you know, safe words and even kids knowing, tell me if somebody touch you let like don't let them don't let them say don't know let them know no tell me so i can handle it because people who are predators will, will prey on kids who think they can't tell anybody and right. then that's when the secrets come in so yeah yeah i i think that's so a couple things i definitely want to key in on the the children knowing how to tell an adult so if there are any parents watching um the first step is educating your child and, and I have, I've taught a lot of parent classes, like parents that um, have little tiny children under three years old. And they're like, well, when do you start talking about this? You start talking about sexuality age appropriately before they have words. When we start teaching them how to touch their head, shoulders, knees, and toes, right. are we calling them by other names? No, we are not. It's your and head, was, those shoulders. It's even your, good touches and bad touches because you right. want to know the dip, good, good and bad. Because the I was always crying. told what it's called. I was always right. told my parents never baby talked anything to me. So right. like my understanding at an early age was like made to where people couldn't really mess with me, and people tried. And it, hey, hey, what the hell? Don't make me tell my daddy on you. <laughs> like that, that has happened. You know what I'm saying? Where I've had to like stop people, older, you know, people. From doing stuff, but like all in all, they would never really try me because I was one of those kids that you could tell I would say something, but everybody would say, Hey, if somebody does something to you, you say something. My aunt said it, my mom said it, my grandmother said it, my daddy said, it. like everybody said that to us as children. So, like, yeah, you have to verbalize that to them constantly to let them know they're safe and that they're protected so that if somebody does do something they can say something because people definitely notice those kids that seem more quiet and shy they right. really do right it's your vulva it's your penis it's your breasts it's your buttocks yes. and we believe you right like that's the that's the real key is we believe you anyway I really appreciated this heavy conversation, but can we start talking about some orgasm? Listen, I was like, about to get into the question, but we was, you know, we was flowing and we like to let things happen, you know, organically me too, here. Me too. I just don't want everybody to be like, this girl is a Debbie Downer. No, I think mm -mm. We, we have Necessary. these conversations. Yeah, we have these conversations because we not playing with y'all. Y'all not about to be in our comments and we having some vapid conversation when y'all need to have this information. Y'all know I don't play with y'all like that around here. I mean, um, I'll give you what you want me to give you. You have consent to take it all from me, ladies. Whatever y'all okay. want. I'm ready then. So what is the most common form of kink that you encounter? Usually BDSM. People are really interested in how to explore BDSM. I have gotten a lot of interest in um, multiple partner play. And how do you address that um, in a relationship? I'm not going to tell you what network I walked. I almost walked off a set from, but there was a, a very prominent all black network that had me come on and do a video with them. And one of the questions was like, like from a, from a viewer, I want to have a threesome with my husband and one of his friends. How would you do that? And there was like two other people on the panel that were like, that was what kind of wife are you? That's not how good women should act in a marriage. And I literally in the middle of taping was like, excuse me, 
See, what we're not going to do is shame people's fantasies. And I will exit stage left because if somebody wants to explore multiple partners, it's my hope that I can help them find the language for that. So let's say somebody out there is like, I want to explore kink. I want to explore multiple partners. I want to explore swinging. Um, a couple tips. Conversation is really important. Um, I think this is a great way for you to use porn as a way to introduce whatever you want from your partner. So BDSM. Hey, babe. You know, the other day I was watching this video and I kind of, or I was watching some porn in my special masturbation time. And I stumbled across this video that included X, insert whatever act you want to do. And I found myself getting really turned on. Could I share the video with you? Or would you be interested and open to talking about how we might be able to intertwine this into our sex life? And so kink, BDSM, and multiple sex partners and or like swingers clubs have been what I get a lot of. That's something I really want to do, to be honest. Like me and my friends have been talking about this, but we really want to go to a swingers club. Um, more so just so we can like walk around and survey first. And then I'll decide if I want to bring my husband. But I don't want to do anything, but I really want to like just be a voyeur because I'm one of those people that feel like I collect information to use later mentally in sex. So if I were to go somewhere like that and see something that I found like, oh, wow, like that's me on, then I would be like, OK, let's do it because I don't really I don't like porn in that way. Like a lot of what is outside of the regular scope in porn is it can be violent to me or like just don't feel good or don't look right. Like I, the BDSM, you know what I always think about with BDSM? What? The, um, 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 what was the show y'all? American what Horror Story. The motherfucker Aren't that was in the zip. I thought you were going to say Fifty Shades of Grey. No, yeah, I, I thought you were about to say that. No, yeah. I'm going deeper than that. Um, and I've seen this before on Real Sex when they put somebody in full latex and, and I'm claustrophobic, so that shit kind of freaks me out. So I don't know why my mind always goes to, like, not just the whipping or the tying, because I've done that, but the actual, like, you know, encasement of leather like and shit. Yeah, it freaks pose. me out. I love, okay. listen, honey, I love that freaks me latex. out. I'm claustrophobic. I love it. Look at me with my little rope right now. I love well, a good I latex. Go. I love it. First of all. This is I my love a good that was, <laughs> that was supposed to go to the club. I love, I, I love. So here's a let me tell you something about sex clubs. If you go to a sex club, you are inevitably participating in a sex club. Um, and you are participating maybe at your lowest level as a voyeur, mm -hmm. right? Just going, like you said, to check it out. Maybe you and your partner may have sex in the sex club therefore you would be acting in an exhibitionist right capacity but maybe you go and i'm gonna help you shift your language it's not whipping um it's called flogging right so that's mm -hmm. where you might be um it receives some type of impact impact play flogging um Maybe you'll get lucky enough to go to a sex club that has um, electric impact impact play, and you can play with a little bit of a, an electric stroke. Does it? Does that have? Is that like a probe? And it, yeah. it like when you touch? Oh yeah. wow! Yeah. yeah. Oh okay. I mean, there's a lot of fun. I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> no, I'm, don't be honestly, sorry. I'm very open. Like, and I no. tell y'all this all the time. Like, I'm I'm bisexual. I'm extremely open. Like, I just. I'm always curious what I might like. Have you seen that show Goop on Netflix? I haven't. I'm I, I am cute. not going to act like I prescribe to the Goop. I can't. But I understand. I know. Yes. Okay. So I I don't know anything about all of that. But there was something that did interest me. And y'all, they had this exercise in Goop where they kind of like just take you through like exercises to see if it's something that you would respond to. And I was like, that shit was interesting to me. 
because I often like wonder about like certain touch, which I don't know if I would like it until it happens by accident versus kind of trying shit to see what you would like. So what I mean, but you look like you have a strong opinion on Goop. So that's why I, I'm I'm sorry that this is going out of order of the questions, y'all. But no, I, I mean, I have no, I, I honestly don't have anything to say about Goop, but I'd much right. rather explore your interest in and everybody else's interest in sex clubs. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I like to be really honest with people and let them know, like. Let's roll back our romanticized view of all the hot pieces of ass that may or may not be at a sex club and recognize. Yeah, no, I thought about that too. I thought about the regular people. Ass, nasty looking people that may be in the sex club. I have. Let's, That's why I'm I just want to go and look first. I'm not going to say they're all nasty, but I'm going to say, like, you know, I mean, I'm almost 40, so I don't want to act like. It'll be real people there. It's not yes. going to be like a real world beautiful model. Right. Like sex no, but you know what I imagine, right? But Ron, I imagine Ron Jeremy in my mind. You know? <laughs> like, no, I, I mean, I have know. not. I have not experienced. I'm sure there are those places, but I have not experienced that type of establishment. Um, okay. But it's also like, you know. When you step into those places, I think you already know that. All I'm going to say is just make a list of what you're comfortable with before you step into that place and that mm -hmm. space and really take time to have a conversation with yourself to identify what your comfort level is and then go into the space knowing your comfort level and lean into the experience, whether you want to show up as just a voyeur, whether you want to show up as just an exhibitionist. I think that everybody should allow themselves if they are comfortable with that experience, because it's one I wouldn't return, honey. It ain't no H and M shirt that done got a hole. I'm going to keep it. It's a, it's a high quality experience that I, have had a couple of times and I'm super, super happy with it. Not to say it's, I'm trying to do it every third Sunday, but no, but I, something that, you know, good memory in the back or the front, whatever the case or, may be. Or however, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just saying, whatever. Okay. Listen, that was my question. <laughs> yep. I mean, I, I hope I'm not boring. Jay Lee, you're, Jay Lee, you're muted. Yeah, she's muted. I'll be forgetting all the time. My mom was I know, girl. It's I okay. A, I got an extra question. So with the whole exhibitionism, we would like to do threesomes. Okay, we had a conversation was it last week on our panel about threesomes, yep. about how we have females, you know, two females, one man, and how there's a stigma about if a female wants to be with two men, that may be too much. How do you feel about that? Do you think that there is any fairness to the thought that a woman who wants to be with two men that's a that's a, a train and not a threesome or should more people like be like you know it's just two penises and a vagina well first of all i think that's the motherfucking patriarchy fuck that shit let's dismantle that shit okay a, a couple things we have to start realizing that just because a, a, a woman who is cisgendered and heteronormative wants to experience the pleasures of multiple men at the same time, that does not make her a whore, nor is that a train. Because the only reason we think it's a train is because it is on a woman. Okay, so we have framed our perspectives of sexuality through the male gaze, right? That's why lesbianism and lesbian porn is so popular because it is a turn on to men. To men. Right? And, and so, to me. Me too, girl. I know that's the only porn I be getting off of. Me but that's too. We're not here to, yeah, not here yeah, to talk true. about what I, we're not here to talk about what I play with in my 130 masturbation appointment with myself. <laughs> that is my lunch break. Yes, it is. I have no problems admitting it. But the point is, is that we have become so conditioned to buy into the patriarchal archetypes 
of what is acceptable in sexuality. And as black people, it blows my mind because what we don't understand or what we have not grasped yet is that patriarchal norms are rooted in white supremacy. If you look back and you really, because remember black history major, if you look back at some of the indigenous cultures in Africa, pre-slavery, there were a ton of matriarchal tribes where women, and, and it's not just African cultures, it's a lot of other cultures from people of color, where women had multiple partners Indigenous communities, even in the United States, native indigenous communities were not tied to a patriarchal norm because men would be hunters and gatherers who would have to go off and try to get food. Therefore, at that time, we didn't know if you were coming back. So we would have multiple male partners to try to continue the procreation. I'm just saying, I'm saying, like if we look at this in kind of a more open perspective, right? The idea of patriarchy didn't really come in until we started like, you know, herding goats and shit. And we're like, oh, you can't make babies without a man and a woman. But that's neither here nor there. My point is, um, I think we have to start to move beyond this idea of two men makes a woman a whore. Who said that shit? Who said it? And I also think that that comes from a man, a man feeling like his masculinity will be compromised if when there's another man in a room and that dick is bigger. But wow. this also goes back to white supremacy because, you know, I, I just got to keep it real. And they the fact that big dick envy. With a black dick and this, big dick envy. OK. And a false narrative and this is the biggest thing that really that that I really appreciate you having me on so I can say white supremacy and its connection to sexuality in the black community is huge. We continue to proliferate the narrative that the black man is a sexual beast and or god. Now, you go back 500 years, the black man was the rapist and a sexual beast that was a threat to the white community. It's the same now. But that also meant the black woman was a whore. Therefore, she was never able to be abused and or raped. Therefore, she was less valuable then unless she was producing offspring that the white man could use as chattel for his own financial gain. I don't you know why. Speak that, you better speak that truth. Wow, you know. In Listen. this Black History Month, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to say, like, I get frustrated because a lot of times when I do things like eight mm. at the table and I say, why are you trying to beat me up? And people want to be like, but that's the language I use. And I sit there and I'm like, you have absolutely no idea how deeply this is rooted in white supremacy because you are continuing to proliferate the narrative that the black man and his big black dick is the sexual prowess beast who's coming in. Oh shit, hit me in the face. <laughs> and killing the game. But that also means that the black woman is a whore and can never be raped. And what, and what you're saying makes perfect sense. I think you just have to be talking to the people who are open to hearing that. I feel like that's why we're having such a formal informational conversation for real. Because you, you take it all the way back. Like Bonnie mentioned before, we were just talking about the Bill Cosby docuseries. Beyond just talking about Bill Cosby, they explain like the early ages of what black people were in the media. And he explained how either the black woman had to be an over-sexualized whore or a mammy. And that goes exactly to what you were saying, either for sexual use, so that way they couldn't be abused or either taking care of someone else's child or providing someone for labor. So I'm really glad that you're saying that this Black History Month, because 
I mean, a lot of it, it just goes back to the root. Like what you're saying, if people have to be open to, you know, um, really Unwrap. soaking this information. Yes, because I feel like the sexiness that comes with sex, you also have to know the flip side. And that's why sex is so whack so early. We, we were talking about that like a month ago. Whenever you first have sex and it's so like, you know, inexperienced and you're just repeating things that you've heard in music and things, you know, beat the pussy up, up, uh, up, uh, then it's, it's whack. So thank you, number one. Thank, I don't I have mean, a number two. I mean, no, that's fine. I also want to say, I just want to be very clear. Black women have been given the categories, the Jezebel, the Mammy, or the Sapphire, right? The Jezebel is the whore. The Mammy is like, I'm going to take care of everybody until all my hair fall out and I'm out here talking about uh, Seeley or whoever in the color purple type shit. Or you are the Sapphire, which I always come up with Amorosa, like this stern businesswoman, shrewdy, right? But white women are allowed to vacillate across all three of those characters. Cheryl Sandberg, the le hashtag lean in. If you read that book, she talked about being the wife the mother and the sexual desire to her partner. But black women have never been allowed to be all three. Black men have not allowed us to be those things. Society has not allowed us to be those things. And I, as someone who is a sexologist, can tell you from experience, it has been very difficult for me to try to walk a fine line between, yes, I can talk positively about sex and I can give you a small glimpse into my sex life, but I will draw a boundary to you're being too prudish. Didn't, first of all, nobody asked Dr. Ruth how she sucked dick. Nobody asked her that. No, okay. one, no one ever asked Dr. We didn't even know Dr. Drew was gay until Love Line was off the air. Nobody asked him how he liked his asshole rimmed, but for some reason, I have noticed black sex positive and or sexologists oftentimes are put in positions where they are forced to disclose their own sexual proclivities. And I have made it very much a part of my brand to draw a line and say, I'm not going to give you details. I mean, honey, it's not a, because it's not about you. It's about the conversation of what needs to be discussed. And, and I think people sure. don't get, because you know, I'm, I'm, I just turned 40 and I can say when I, I remember when I lost my virginity, I'm like, what is this? I, it's, it was nothing. But as I got older, I started having conversations, the conversation of what you like, what you don't like, what you want, what you don't want. That's what matters. So it's like, it shouldn't be about what you want particularly, but let's discuss what we all should be discussing and what I like should matter to you. What do you, does your man know what you like? He don't, well, because don't I don't, I don't want what I like from you. So it shouldn't matter to you. See how that goes. Right. And, and see, also, that's another thing. Go ahead, Nisi girl. No, it's also a dangerous line. Like what Michelle was just saying, because of the way that black women have been casted in society for you to try to be the educator, it's a way to, to lose credibility if they over-sexualize you. Mm-hmm. And Make harm you. Because then she's a freak. She's a freak and she's not, she, she not an expert because... Right. Yes, a freak. You know. Yes, that's what it is. But see, So that's why when that funny shape-head boy was asking you stuff, you got upset about it. And it was like, well, yeah, because you're trying to get personal with her in a way so that you can try to disrespect her. You know, oh, you wish you could get this dick type situation. And it's like, sir, don't nobody want you in your headband dick. Don't nobody want that from you. Thank you, though. <laughs> you can save it. Give it to old girl sitting next to you because I didn't ask for it. Um, but yeah, you could definitely see where he was trying to go with that. And you knew he was going there with it. So it was like, no, we're not doing that. I absolutely mm -hmm. noticed that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, and, and, and here's the thing. And I just want to talk about me personally, right? I take a lot of pride in working beyond the internets in classrooms, community center basements, church groups, 
um, because I, I, I believe in my people. I may never become a millionaire. I may never be Oprah, but I swear to God, from the crack house to the white house, honey, I'm going to teach you about sexuality in an unapologetic way that is medically accurate, affirming, and age appropriate. But that requires me to hold up a level of integrity. And while I could sell out and I could tell you all my stories, honey, because I've got them. You know what? All of us, we should go get drinks sometimes. I'll tell you some of my stories. Y'all, y'all motherfuckers be like, ew. No, I, I have what? Some what? <laughs> hey, we do. <deal. laughs> but, you know, my goal in life is to one day testify um, in front of Congress as to why we need a federally mandated sex education program K through 12 across this nation. Right? You know, uh, Cory Booker presented a bill called the REA Act. And that's important that we pass federally. There, I work, I work in Congress. A lot of people do not, I have a day job, like dildos and vibrators and vaginas. This is my fun stuff. I literally work on, on writing legislative policy to create a more reproductive, equitable space for people of color. And we appreciate I, your services. Oh, no, it's terrible. But thanks. No problem. Also, for all the however many people are watching this, please, please, please start educating yourself to the abortion laws. Because we are we are heading for a let's just come on. I, 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 it's like everybody wants to talk about how I had a puppet and talking about, oh, why are you beating up the pussy? And I'm like, yo. We are approaching a midterm election and Roe v. Wade is about to be gutted in the Which United States. And I don't think people understand how deeply that is going to impact our, our, our communities. And I, know, I personally, I've been in this 15 years. I know what the math is. The math is mathing and we're fucked in six ways to Sunday, we are fucked up on this shit. But nobody wants to get involved. Nobody wants to talk about it because it's not Kim. It's not Kanye. It's not the latest drip drip. Hashtag no cap. Like, wake up, people. And we don't understand how voting rights and abortion are connected through the filibuster. And we don't have time for me to go through that because nobody really cares. But this shit... The opposition has been planning this for probably the last 40 years, and we are fucked. We are, we are, we have to wake up now and start getting real active because shit's about to go south real quick. And I so just. Besides, so besides taking away those specific rights, in what other ways is this detrimental to us as, as Black women specifically? Uh, well, when you start, okay, so access to abortion care is a big deal, uh, because oftentimes individuals that need terminations tend to be young people, let's say under 24, um, who have limited education. So they're working a hourly wage job. Um, they are, they don't have health insurance um, and they, they lack the level of education that they would need to understand how to navigate medical system, like the, the medical system to get the care that they need. So let's say that they choose to move forward with the pregnancy. They don't have the education or access to information to help them move through that pregnancy safely. And when you start to look at the sheer numbers of maternal mortality in Black communities, that is problematic. Now, let's move away from that and start to look at wage gaps. The wage gap in America for Black women is exorbitant compared to their white counterparts. And I'm speaking their white female counterparts. When you start to look at their white male counterparts, we're looking over a dollar 25 an hour. So a black woman 
who works the same job as a black man is paid somewhere less than a dollar plus and for their work. I mean, we talk about that every year. So there's the wage gap. But if you're someone who's not making as much money and now you're bringing a child into it, how do you pay for health care? How do you pay for child care? How do you continue to, de- build, to build economic wealth in Black communities when you're doing it on your own and you're at a disadvantage? Those are two examples of, of issues. Um, I think in addition to that, there's a lot of men out there, cisgendered, heteronormative Black men who have benefited from access to abortions and like DJ Khaled or Rick Ross said, and they ain't even know it. Mm. Well, let me get into uh, a viewer so question. I need, so yeah, I need get some into black the viewer men for that. Child, they don't listen. That's a whole nother conversation for the another people video. people didn't even know they was going to get all this today. They okay. didn't know. Too much? No, no, this is this is enough. This is everything. Okay, I, I, I just I sometimes get overzealous. I get overzealous, but I'm gonna hold on to this. The black we get it. No, yeah, we get it. Like a stress ball. So, mm-hmm. first viewer question: um, yep. Can we discuss the dangers of saliva being used like during sex? Um, many women and sometimes men, have, women have talked about the UTIs. Um, you know, from oral sex. So what mm-hmm. precautions do you suggest people take when it comes to bacteria in the mouth? Brush your teeth. I just want to tell you, I did look up all this, but I already knew it. First of all, it's not about brushing your teeth. So here's the deal. After somebody goes, okay, so yes, you can get a UTI from oral. It's much less likely than actual intercourse. But what you need to recognize is that and I'm going to pull it out. So if this is your vulva, right? Labia majora, labia minora. Um, this is your vagina. I hate it when people call the whole thing a vagina. Actually, the whole is just the vagina. This is what some might consider the G spot, like right here, up, upper thing. And then this little rosebud, that would be the urethra. So listen, when you're having sex with this beautiful vulva, um, Bacteria can get into the urethra, okay? So you should always urinate after sex because if you empty the bladder after sex, you'll be able to push out that bacteria. Now, you shouldn't be super, super concerned that like, oh, I just woke up, he has morning breath, he's going down on me or she's going down on me and I'm going to get a UTI. You shouldn't really do that. You just... After you come all over their face, you should just be like, okay, babe, I'm going to go to the bathroom. And you can go to the bathroom, empty your bladder, and then get in the shower and wash your genitals. It does happen, but you can reduce the amount of UTIs you may get by just excavating your bladder after intercourse and or oral. I had to learn that the hard way. Sex toys, man. Sex toys. Um, I had a hell of a vibrator, man, and did not know that I needed to pee. Did not know. And kept getting UTIs. I mean, and then I remember I got it from the sex toy, then was like, I'm not fucking with the sex toy anymore, and then changed sex toys. And then I rode my bike and caught a UTI that way. It was terrible. That, That happened in like the same month. But go on. I'm sorry. Uh, Jamie, oh, no. question? That was, that <laughs> wow. was great. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so this question. Um, this person says that they're 57 years old and postmenopausal. They're, uh, they're a single woman. Yep. Um, she says that often she's approached by men that are actually younger than her, but she's not really interested because her libido has all but disappeared and wants to know what she can do to restore and eventually maintain her uh, libido. She prefers natural options, she put it. Okay, so honey, your most natural option is, baby girl, use it or lose it. Start creating time in your life to masturbate. So what happens when we go through menopause, right? 
we start to lose estrogen. Our hormones become different, which will impact your ability to lubricate and become turned on. There are a couple things you can do. You can work out more, working out more, um, you know, kicks up your endorphins, which can actually help to turn you on. But you also actually, and this is the worst part, because there are going to be times when you're tired. I don't want to do it. I'm not turned on. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Girl, you better grab that vibrator and buzz it, buzz it, buzz it, buzz it, buzz it, buzz it out. Okay. Because that area and that experience for us women, it's use it or lose it. So I encourage you to take time to build into your daily self-care practice opportunities for you to masturbate, opportunities for you to focus on your sexuality as a part of self-care. You deserve great sex until you're dead because quite frankly, that's what men are out here doing. But women, because how we have been taught We've been taught at a certain age, we should just give up on it. Our libido's lower. We shouldn't try to tap into that. No, 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 no. Fight that urge, honey, and start masturbating. So here are my recommendations. Identify once a week an opportunity for you to create a sexual self ritual. Light some candles, burn some incense, smoke a joint. I don't give a shit, okay? But rub on your body, dance in front of a mirror, create an atmosphere and an environment where you're going to feel your sexiest. Masturbate. And then I want you to really feel, I want you to feel what that orgasm felt like. You know, I actually, I actually carve out time on a weekly basis where I masturbate and meditate at the same time. And when I'm orgasming, I am manifesting greatness in my life because you have to remember your chakra, that energy, that masturbation energy, that's a lot of energy. So I when told I, my followers about this practice. I'm going to do that tonight then. Girl. I I'm actually taught a whole on. class on this. I've, I've taught classes on this and I'm thinking about bringing it up back but I did a 30 day um, meditative masturbation to manifest in your life. Cause there's a lot you can manifest. That's a lot of energy. But I wanna tell people who might be like, oh, I'm perimenopausal. Honey, you got to use it or you gonna lose it. So start masturbating. Let them young, let them, let them PYTs give you their number and then take them. Take them for all the nut they got, girl. Take them for all the nut they got. All oh, the child. Nut. Okay. okay. Uh, listen, so the next question is, um, this is something I've never even heard of. Um, I'd like to bring more awareness to vaginismus. Vagismus. Vagismus. Say it again. Vagismus. I mean, I'm Vagismus. Okay. Yeah, so, so do you Go know ahead, what that please. is? Please. I have no idea, ma'am. Explain. <laughs> So that's where the actual, remember I told you like, I'm so annoyed with people calling this the vagina when this is the vagina, the vagina is the hole. So vagismus is where the actual vagina muscles and the walls will tighten up, not allowing anything to penetrate. Oftentimes this is a psychological condition, meaning somewhere you may have blocked it out. You have experienced a trauma. And so your vagina actually will not let anything go in. You can work with a physical therapist. They may use dilators with you. They may use some fingering techniques with you, but it is a totally normal thing. Please, 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 please don't think you are abnormal if you are experiencing this. My top tips for this is one, get a good counselor or therapist to start talking and verbalizing your experience around this condition. And two, Um, once you've been able to talk to a therapist and or your general practitioner, like if you're like, I don't want to go to a therapist, tell your general practitioner. A lot of people don't tell their general practitioners about their sex issues, right? But your general practitioner is your general practitioner. They're the ones that are going to give you the sign off 
to allow your health insurance to let you see a specialist. So you absolutely have to tell them. My pussy tightens up every time I try to put something in it. And you should probably keep a journal. When does it tighten up? Is it tightening up when you try to put a tampon in or a diva cup or when you're masturbating? Or is it only tightening up when you're trying to have intercourse with another person? Because if that's the case, I'm going to tell you, you need to go to a therapist immediately. One that specializes in sexuality. And in addition to that, you should tell your primary care physician, hey, I am noticing I'm not able to allow anything in my vagina during intercourse. I think we should talk about where I should go. Hey, also, I have gone to a therapist. And you really need to create that triangle of care so you can get the best care possible. Be good for yourself, you know? So what are some strategies for getting to know your body in a positive and healthy way? That's a great question. Besides our masturbation, because we're going to all do that and meditate and stuff. But, you know, just getting to know your body in a positive and healthy way was the question. So I think most importantly is to, I, I think, yes, masturbation. Yes. Ah, la, la, la. I need people to start scheduling an hour out of their week where they are not on their phones, where they are not connected to binge watching and they're doing something for their body. Like literally today at five o'clock when I got off work, I put my sneakers on, I put my weighted vest on, I put my hoodie on, I grabbed my phone and my headphones and I got out the door and I walked for an hour through the city. I had no place to go. I had no destination. I just said, I need to move physically. And Bondi does this and I watch her and I see you on all your Instagram. That is moving, what Bondi like. Moving, doing all, 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 all the workouts. Um, and, and listen, you don't have to be good at working out. Just, well, let's not even call it working out. You don't have to be great at moving. Just get your body moving. I think after COVID, we've all been sitting for far too long. We don't know how to move anymore. Like, not just in, in the world socially, but like, just solo. We don't. We don't know how to move. I see somebody. You got to put your music on. You got to put your music on. You got to walk. You know, you got to dance in your house, girl. That's what you got to do. You. That's what I do. Yeah. Or actually I'm working out was a, a good saw for managing my level of day-to-day -day anxiety. For real, for real. It takes the extra time. So you think you don't want to do it. But when you do it, like you actually notice the change for real. And it feels so good. Mm -hmm. So the next viewer question. Let's talk about porn. The next viewer question is how has pornography shaped the landscape in which women view their bodies and sexuality? How thin is the line between empowerment and harm? Which you you, you have touched on that on that. But oh let's get let's get to it. I don't even know if we have enough time to go into this because social science points to the fact that anal sex took a huge jump once porn was readily available on the internet. And then it becomes kind of the chicken and egg question. Um, did anal sex desires come before anal sex was, you know, viewable on porn or whatever? I'm not here. No, to not for the regular of us. No, it was not. Because I will tell you right now, it wasn't until I saw it in porn. And I was like, was like I want to try it, which was a lot of women. Only, only getting eight. Only, only the getting eight and the ass eating. Um, but not the penetration because I learned a long time ago that those muscles, once they are broken, they're broke. So I, I don't want to play Is with those true? muscles. I, I have heard that before. Is that true? I think that you can train your sphincter muscles to accept penetration in a healthy way. 
But if you if you don't train it, if you don't train those muscles. You're going to shit on yourself. That's what I always heard. I wouldn't say, I don't, I would not say you would shit on yourself. You probably have a higher likelihood of anal fissures and hemorrhoids mm. um, than shitting on yourself. Okay. And that I wouldn't say, I would, I would, I would pull back from shitting on yourself to, girl, you may leakage? have hemorrhoids. I okay. wouldn't even say leakage. I would say more. This is what I heard from some of the gay boys. Look, some of the gay boys told me it was a whole That's situation. Honey, honey. That's different. We, Tell yeah. me the truth. Is it is it different? different? Girl, my pussy be leaking <laughs> too. And if that's the main cavity, well, you know. So I you think right. we have to, you right. We uh. have to recognize and respect. Recognize and respect. You know, boy pussy, ain't no put. I'm not gonna call it that. Bussy. Ain't no pussy is pussy, right? <laughs> but it's a, is a thing and i respect all people who be taking it giving it and like you know really because i right down there jamie i couldn't take <laughs> she it she is cracking up <laughs> you see i just want to be very clear i could not do why, it why she look like my son is Ana was a, Ana was a lot I, I think male Ana was a lot so they you know that's just this little, you know they have a skill little, set that i don't they, because they, it's a process for them. They have to do things to even no, get ready for that. for all of us, honey. Yeah, yeah. We to all end up in but I feel like situation. we have. But I think, but I think their hole that they have to use is a bit different from the one we can use. It, so no, it's like, the same. It's the same hole oh, with the same yeah, conditions. I, they just use it more saying, often. Right. That, that's it right there. So it's just, yeah, like, just so that's why it's different for us because we may not be having anal sex every time we have sex. Some of us are. Some of us are. Mm, yes, that's true. Okay. We can't judge. We can't judge. I'm us. not judging, but I just right. my no ass clenched up. It wasn't judgment, but it was personal pain. Clench up. Okay. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was real. Like, don't let's not have this conversation. No. Can we move Girl. on? What's the next question? Jamie, what's the next? <laughs> okay. Like, yes. Um, my booty's like Kevin Hart. I wasn't ready. <laughs> I wasn't ready. <laughs> Um, funny. Okay, so um, this question is: Can a woman that has never had a, a squirting orgasm, like, can they have one? And how will they go about achieving that? Oh God, here we go about squirting. All right, I have to readjust myself. So, okay, here's the deal with squirting. All right, um, everybody's anatomy is different. Everybody's body is different. Every way we experience orgasm is different. I think this concept of squirting um, really puts a lot of pressure on vulva owners to be able to perform a certain sex act that men will like and feel as though they have hit some level of gravitas in their manhood. Not everybody can squirt. Also, if you look at the real basic science, and a lot of people will disagree with me on this, but yeah, it you have to understand, I can't even draw it for you right now, but the way the uterus and the bladder and the vagina sit internally, first of all, nobody's squirting across the room. That's your... The porn that we see of people squirting, I have no doubt that's urine. Absolutely. Oh yeah, that's, that's for sure. What what oh, we yeah. are Jada to... Fire is definitely pissing all over the place in that one porn. And that good for good for them. Good yeah. for let it <laughs> yeah, out. It, it plays good on television. It absolutely it plays absolutely good on, does. on your cast. Yeah. But what I'm but but what I'm trying to let people know is that this idea of of what we have come to normalize as squirting is total fantasy. We have romanticized what it is. If you're going to squirt, it's going to be like a more than a true. 
right? True. I used to be able um, to do it. I can't do it anymore. Um, mm-hmm. My college days, um, it used to happen quite often. Like, honestly, when I first started having sex, it felt like it would happen. Because I remember the first time I think I had an orgasm, I was about to, and I stopped myself. I don't know why, but it was like, stop that. What is that? So, like, from then on, I would kind of, like, let it happen. And now, you know, and I overused it. Just, just really took advantage mm. of the ability and now that i'm an adult child the old girl is like nah <laughs> nice try. Though. so i have a question about a follow-up question about the the squirting and stuff so how does that when you mentioned the uterus and you mentioned the bladder how does or does it at all does squirting affect the uterus and the bladder in any way no 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 no, no. it's more like the uterus and the bladder um impact squirting I'm going to try to draw a really crappy, crappy picture of what this might look like. And Oh, God. What? Oh, God. I literally pulling this dildo off my thing destroyed my video of all of you. But there you oh, are. Okay. I'm going to say, you're still here with us. <laughs> a powerful D. Oh, okay. okay. Put it on the wall. That is yeah. a great suction cup for how heavy that thing looks. All right, listen, that is the bedroom candy vitamin D 12 incher. Vitamin D plus. It's, that's candy? what that is. That's what that is. So if you were Jamie, to, shut up. <laughs> no, shut is up. that bedroom is candy? Is that candy? Yes, it okay. is. Okay, yes. Yeah, so, okay, candy birds. Hey girl, you candy know we've been trying to get a little deal with you. Call to. us. We have Follow. use our code. Ooh, ladies first. Growing. Okay, listen. Okay, so this is a really bad picture. This is like the absolute worst picture. So please don't judge me. So if this was the poop shoot, this is the rectum, and this is the bladder, right? Usually the uterus sits over the bladder here. Okay. Okay. This is a really terrible picture. And then this is the vagina where I wrote the arrow. That looks okay. Cool. Okay, so, so the vagina. Okay, so pink's gone in there. So uh-huh. when the and that's like this. These lines right here are the labia. Gotcha. Okay. Lips. So the okay. penis goes in. The penis goes in here, and they're fucking, and it pushes on right here, which is the bladder. Mm-hmm. And then. Uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to write backwards. That would be the clitoris. Okay. And then that means that like right here is where the urethra would be. Okay. Let me do this better. Which is why it feels like you have to pee when you have, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm trying to get out. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm trying mm-hmm. to get out. So, so if this is the bladder and this is the clit and then right here is where your um urethra is and then these are the labia right here right Mm -hmm. so the penis is going up into this space Mm -hmm. filling this space filling this space filling the space filling the space and so it pushes down on the bladder Mm -hmm. and that's what and science tells us even if you empty your bladder before intercourse, the, there is something called the urethral sponge, which I'm not, it's, it's like, there's like this a whole thing. It's a whole science thing where there's a urethral sponge that during intercourse may get collect a little bit of fluid. And then once you're about to orgasm and you have released and relaxed all those things down there, skitty, 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 skitty. Okay. okay. Um, but, but, but I will say this. One thing we don't talk about enough in our community um, is fibroids and endometriosis mm. and mm. how that impacts our experience with sex and how we Makes have it painful, it. right? And child, so many things. So, so, so many things. So I'm just saying, I just hope that the work that I'm doing is offering an opportunity for us to have more in-depth conversations about dick, pussy, you know, um, in in a way that normalizes it. This is going to bother me. I think it is. I (laughs) 
I think it is. So the next question that we have is, is it normal to bleed after getting fingered hard? That seems like a lesbian Hard, question. I think is the key word. I feel like it was it was hard all capitalized? And do they have nails? Like, did they clip It wasn't. Their it was wasn't hard. It wasn't capitalized. No, they say fingered hard. That's all they say. And that yeah, makes me feel like lezzy vibes. And that means just hard, but not like nothing. You know, not no, 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 no. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to err on the side of no on this one. That means you either were not lubricated appropriately, the person the used too much force, they had too many hangnails, jagged ass nails. Get your manicure on, please. And please don't come, please don't come to my pussy with an inch and a half long, like, my nails are usually done, they are not done right now, but please don't do it. It's not, like, put on a glove. Also, if you have nails and you're going to finger your partner, a really great way to keep it safe is finger condoms. A lot of people are like, where do I find those? Yes, I get it. But you can find latex gloves a whole lot of places. I mean, we coming out of a global pandemic. You get it on Amazon. Amazon got everything. Hello. And get them in black and make it nasty. Make it nasty. Mm -hmm. And if you have fingernails, which today I don't, but usually I do, um, grab cotton balls, cover your nails with cotton balls, and then put the latex glove on. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like a little bulbous little thing. And it's like, boo. So it doesn't hurt because that sh that sharp skinny feeling mm -hmm. can yeah. hurt your insides. Can, That's yeah, why. It can, yeah, it can create. Yeah. It can. It can most definitely, definitely, definitely create some discomfort. Mm. Scratching the labia. Um. So, do sex toys change your ability to orgasm from a penis alone? Will I even look at sex the same without a toy? Well, let's be very clear about how the clitoris works. And you see me looking around because I'm looking for my clitoris. So I don't, I don't know where my little tiny baby clitoris is. But here's the deal. Sex toys are great because oftentimes people use sex toys externally to stimulate the clitoris. The clitoris right here. You know, the thing that beautiful hood covers. You know, if it was a penis and it had a hood, we'd call it an uncircumcised penis because... The penis and the clitoris, very, very similar, actually mostly the same, but no one wants to admit it. Um, so the clitoris is like an iceberg, right? It's like the iceberg, you see the tip, which might be the mountain, but usually that mountain has a lot under the surface. Very similar for a clitoris. So the clitoris is here, right? But it, it travels down two to three inches down into the vulva. Again, still looking for the clitoris. Um, and what you have to remember is a sex toy isn't going to change your sex. You're, you probably always wanted clitoral stimulation before the sex toy. The sex toy just taught you how to get that clitoral stimulation um, without your partner but it makes it even better if you're getting vaginal stimulation with the and clitoral stimulation at I the same swear time. by it it's the only it's type of sex I it have is. Yep. <laughs> it is the only type of sex I have <laughs> yep. I, I, I just want to be very clear like a little this and a little this at the same time it's fantastic but be careful be careful because I have to like so y'all know how people are always like, oh, I can have sex like every day. I cannot. Like I can only have sex maybe three days in a row before I have to take a break because it becomes harder for me to achieve orgasm after a while. Is that but this and, But this I and like this, I get desensitized. I'm it's not, not doing a, that. Here's the thing. I, I, it's, <laughs> not about, it's not about desensitized. That's not what okay. it is. It, it's, it's not like with the vibrating... Oh, whatever. No, okay. I would not say that. Okay. I really think that you can have a great or as orgasm today mm -hmm. and a great orgasm tomorrow, mm -hmm. but we can't anticipate orgasms that will be great every day. 
Cause that, I that's know. like, <laughs> I, I don't want to commit to that negativity, but I understand. I don't think it's negativity. I think it's kind of like, how do you appreciate really, really great days? Mm-hmm. Sans orgasm, just like great days. If you don't have a mediocre day to compare it to. Yeah, this is true. It's not this about like, like I think, and it's not about like, oh, you can't have a great orgasm or a great intimate moment. There are a lot of times when I masturbate that I really enjoy my experience of masturbation, but maybe I didn't have the hardest orgasm. Yes. Right. Yes, it's, that happens. It, it's <clears throat> honoring, it's it's honoring the intercourse or the sex that you have with your partner, or it's honoring it's it's kind of like it's gonna sound corny. You're not looking to the future or to the past, but you're being in the present because that's the gift. It's the Mm -hmm. same with sex. Not every time you're going to have like a huge explosion of an orgasm and you can't you can't compare this experience to the last or to the future. You have to just really be present in the moment. Yep. And just enjoy whatever the moment is and accept mm-hmm. it for what that is. Gotcha. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. Once you simplify it to the days, it's like, okay, nice. But to simplify it a little bit more, one viewer wants to know, how do you know simply when you have achieved an orgasm? I know you said that different people achieve them differently. Each person achieves them differently. But someone wants to know, how do you know when you've had an orgasm? Bitch, you tell me. Bitch, <laughs> tell me. Let me know when you have had an or Because some people going to fart. Some people going to go. Oh, really? Fart. So this, I'm only saying that. I'm really being, I'm definitely exaggerating right now. But my oh, like, oh, like, is it's like anything. I don't know when you're going to have an orgasm. And I'm not here to tell you because I'm not going to fill you up with a fantasy to be like, you're going to squirt all over the place. You're going to get this, that, and the other. You're going to see stars. I can't tell you that because mm-hmm. I'm not Miss Cleo. I'm not mm-hmm. going to sell you no snake oil or no motherfucking lie. What I'm going to tell you is you got to explore for yourself what orgasm feels like. And that takes practice. That mm-hmm. takes a commitment to masturbating regularly and taking notes. Do you want to do masturbation homework? Because if you... I mean, I, I, I said it earlier. I, I started masturbating very early on in life. So <laughs> uh, see, all of us did. Most of us just don't recognize it because we were wow. shamed out of it. You wow, know, like boys, safe, girl. you know, little boys start masturbating in uterus. Well, while they're still in gestation. Really? Most of us start masturbating about. Three or four. We don't masturbate to orgasm at that time. We're we're masturbating because touching our genitals feels good. It's body exploration. We're not there for an orgasm. Masturbation shifts when we move to puberty. But we've been mm-hmm. doing it since we were teeny tiny babies. That's why mm. some people have foot fetishes. It comes from that. Listen, that's a whole other episode. Fetishes is a whole other episode. Because usually our fetishes are formed before we hit puberty. Mm. We just only start to explore and discover them after that in adulthood. That's neither here nor there. But back to the woman who asked me, how do I know I've come or whatever? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Girl, you got to practice. Keep a journal. I, I could tell you when I come, my nipples get hard. I start sweating. I fall asleep quick. My booty starts pulsating. That's not gonna be the. That's not gonna be the same as, you know, Nisi. I mean, but it definitely Everybody feels like a climb. Different. It definitely feels that's, like a that's climb. That's what I'm saying, girl. Jay, that's what I'm saying. Yes, different, but there's a climb happening. I think for everybody, there's a climb, and yes. then you mm-hmm. get there. But my and then you climb go to might not look like your climb. Yeah, no, our climb may not look the same, mm-hmm. but it should still be like a climb of some but sort. But what does climb mean? Rev up, my right? My climb could, could like this. There's is, a there's an area before the orgasm meeting. Like no, totally. What well, whole section? You, you know, the whole time you're having sex, there should be 
that's that's the prime enough to get to where you get. And I think the person asking is thinking, how do I know I have an orgasm versus this is all feeling good? But I'm like, you should still know your body doesn't know what it is. That but means you're not masturbating to me. That's, that's what, what that I'm means. Saying. Well, yeah, that means you're not, not masturbating because right I'm literally talking about the physic, like the physically of what it feels like when you're actually going through it body wise, like in masturbation. You're, you're you know, you got to be all in that mental, of course, but there's like a build up mm -hmm. and you're, pre you're mentally participating in the build up along with the nether regions. OK, mm -hmm. and then you feel the whatever the yak is and then that you know like she said that's whatever that is for you so that's why you have to figure out what that is but if you're trying to ask how to figure that out then you need to get you a vibrator or uh, learn how to play and then just be in the bed with whatever turns you on and figure it out exactly play play i mean if you ain't that's got anything. a vibrator honey you got god's vibrator Ten of them. <laughs> Listen, and I don't, I can't use God's vibrator because I work out and my forearms be getting tired and lyrics be like, you need a vibrator. I got, purple the, tunnel. Purple, I got the purple tunnel. Yes. My, my arthritis be killing me, so yeah, I be I trying can't. to get Ugh, I, my hand. I be getting the ergonomic, the ergonomic sex toys, so I don't have to bend my wrist too much. This is my, terrible. Listen, I'm glad you brought that up, listen. Michelle, because that was my question. That was going to be my okay. next question. The um, I wanted to know the different toys that you use. The vibe, like you know, for the people mm -hmm. that may want to know, people that's getting into that, if you could tell us what you have. This is better than Honey, the I, I use, say but... Honestly, honestly, I will try them all. So this right here is the King from Bedroom Candy. Uh, this one is. I'll turn it on for you. I, I like a trusty dusty. I like a quick vibey vibe, not too much, but now everything yeah. has so many options, right? So this one, you can't even hear this, but this this has vibration on the actual uh this shaft part. And then this is the rabbit ears part, which also has its own vibration for the clitoris. So it would literally go. <clears throat> into and up on gotcha. some people really like this not my thing i'm kind of more of just like a clitoral mm -hmm. like that's where all the nerve yeah. endings are there's eight thousand yeah. of them there and i work a lot i need to go to bed so let's this. get this over i don't want to do this this is tiring la, 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 la. Let's i get just want to hold it there and then get it I over really with. i don't want to be doing this or backing right. myself up against the shower listen, wall like i might too much work. i don't let's just no i need extra. someone listen i need somebody to hold <laughs> listen it's so funny i just did a podcast and they were like oh what something 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 i was like honey I'm tired. Just let me rub it out and keep it going. Like, okay. Also, a big popular thing, I'm just using this as an example, is the air pulse technology, which was originated by Womanizer. But there, the rosebud, I've seen a lot of people talk about, mm. which is that's basically based off um, the Womanizer and the air, air pulse technology. So, it's a bit suction, a bit air pulse. It's gonna pop out air. It's that's gonna what this one does. Air. That's what this one does. Like can, that. Uh, that's like the rosebud, right? Yeah, I've got like yeah. five of these. So you just put this on your clip. Blah blah blah. blah. It's gonna make you come quick. If you are pierced, don't use this. Okay, it is a health hazard if you have pierced your clitoris. I'm just telling you what my homegirl told me. Oh, I'm just saying. If you're pierced, this is not the toy for you. What is I mean, that? You... I'm, I'm wondering what's the feel for that. Because, like, I know why you would get your nipples pierced to add sensitivity. Does it work the same way with your clitoris? I mean, it definitely, it definitely, I have. <clears throat> your friend. I have heard. <laughs> your homegirl. I <laughs> have heard that <laughs> the clitoral piercing is just as sensitive um, and can create pleasure on a lot of levels. But. Uh, like walking down the street in your jeans. I mean, that's a that's a stretch. That I feel really? like that's okay. a myth. It's definitely a myth. Okay. But sometimes um, it can be oversensitive. Oh yeah. And if you are pierced, it is advised that you not use these kind of toys because your piercing can get can get stuck. Stop. 
Oh, sure. Yes. And yes. a lot of people do not. Silver bullet. A lot of people do not talk about how a piercing can get caught on your undergarments. It depending on what your ring is or what your. No one really talks about that stuff. Ooh, that just also, makes my body hurt. <laughs> no one really talks about how piercings can intimidate partners. Mm. And then mm. they they don't really know what to do. And then they're too afraid to ask. And it's a lot of shit. So basically open up I mean, I don't space personally lines. know, but I oh, have been please. told by friends. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, ladies, do we have any other questions for Miss Michelle here? Because I feel like that's everything we have. Okay. Well, with, I know. with that, um, I hope we're I gonna... can come back. I hope you guys want me to come back sometime. We do. Oh, this is a course. really great yeah, this is live event. We should organize a party together. That would be fun. And that that would be fun. What city no, are you? Absolutely, in? Be fun. I'm in New Orleans. What? Jamie's in Atlanta. Atlanta. I'm in Dallas. Dallas. Detroit. And I'm in Detroit. Yeah. Oh, you motherfuckers ain't nowhere near nowhere. <laughs> mm -mm, we all well, listen, us, listen, she ain't nowhere near nowhere. Us three down here is all like within it, a six hour drive. Like, New Orleans is a place I'll come to quickly. Actually, I'm gonna be in I'm gonna be in Orlando at the end of this month. Anybody wanna come come through or what New Orleans is, is not far? What? Actually, I will come well, to New Orleans. So I have a trip planned in March. For my anniversary, so to I so what well, we're going to Jamaica first, and then we're going to LA. Not so, New York, uh, so there's that. But <laughs> I will come to New Orleans, Detroit. I'm not coming there because I no grew up in Indiana. Sorry, girl. Well, we've been talking about planning our whole little meetup thing, so we definitely need to incorporate that. No, what we yes. you know what we no 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 no. I'm gonna speak it into fruition. Okay. Come on. We need to go on ahead and plan a motherfucking weekend in the Bahamas, in the Bahama area, where we bring everybody together and we do a whole weekend retreat with yoga, with classes, with meditation. We're going to bring all your fans, all the whole crew, y'all motherfuckers, we going to put together a super dope weekend. That would be fun. Of inspiration and workouts. Mm -hmm. And we don't, sure. I mean, I probably won't wake up for those. And great mm -hmm. food and yes. drinks and, yes. you know, conversations about dicks and, and yes. pussy and all the shit. Sounds like a time. And if Lyric and I find a girlfriend, well, so be it. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm not. I am. It's okay. It's okay. It's a story for another time. Anyway, so um, we should do that because that sounds fun. So let's just um, call me, girl. Let's, you know. Yeah, you know, we're, we're going to keep in touch so that, first of all, you can come back on here again um, so we can further talk about other kink and sex things more specifically. Um, so we'll do that. But yeah, we've been wanting to plan something, so we should. That would be dope. Um, y'all make sure y'all follow everybody on social media. This is us, okay? At Bondi Blue, at, at Jay Lee's Corner, at Jamie, that's me, at Nisi Dixon. Um, and Miss Michelle Hope's Instagram, okay, is um, please tell them because I don't want to mess it up. It's super simple at MH Sexpert, Michelle Hope, MH Sexpert. Just follow me, but I'm gonna hold y'all to uh, an exotic. No. Because I mean, that's an easy, an easy listen, exactly. we need to get out of our fucking houses. I'm so yes. sick of looking at that's these true. fucking walls. Yes. And screens all the time. I, I need to see outside. Right. So, yes. see people. yes, I'm here for it. So uh, we're, we're, we're done. The ladies, any, anything else you want to add? No, man. Thank we're you. good. So Ooh, thank you so it. much, Michelle. Thank you so much for like being here. It was amazing. We love the conversation. We will definitely have you yes. back. Okay. And with that being said, everyone, thank y'all members. This was all like a culmination of the girls members only and not just everybody out in the streets. So y'all gonna catch this in a, the playback. Y'all out there in the streets, y'all caught this later. Okay. Y'all should have been That's members. Right. Um, but <laughs> we love y'all. We appreciate y'all and y'all have